everyone, welcome to another episode of NSC Finviz powered by CNBC TV 18. Today we are in Pune at the corporate office of one of India's leading technology companies, Zensa Technologies. For me, investment is something like a part of your money, like income, which you earn. Uh, that part uh, which remains after do, uh, making all your expenditures. If I would get a lack of rupee, I would buy some shares, uh, do some fixed deposit. And for taxing, I do some insurance as well. I would like to know more about the current environment policies because there are several number of policies in the market. Mm. Which one is the right to invest? If we see uh, uh, 15 years uh, time period span or something, uh, I would like to know more about the share market as if we can all know the market is going up and down very frequently. So what is the secure area where we can invest our amounts? If I know about shares, I would invest in that. Mm -hmm. Of course, I know that's uh, more beneficial in terms of earning more income if you want to. But if I don't want to take risk, then it will be FD. We are now joined by our two very special experts. We have Firoz Aziz, who is the Director Investments at Anandrati Wealth Management. And we have Harshwadan Rungta, who is a Certified Financial Planner at Rungta Securities. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Harsh, my first question to you. We spoke to them earlier and they're fairly knowledgeable about investing and financial planning. So I want to start things from a perspective that people rarely look at at this young age, which is retirement, retirement planning. And there's no, it's never too early to start planning for your retirement. But what's the way to go ahead to correctly plan your retirement? Well, if there is anything certain to happen with you, it is retirement. The earlier you start, the better it is going to be for you. Now let me give you the methodology with which you can start investing or thinking about retirement planning. The first stage is you estimate uh, the average cost that you incurred today for a basic standard of living. Okay, That would be say 25,000 for instance. You inflate this amount by around 30 years or 25 years, the number of years you have left to retire. Considering inflation into, you know, putting inflation into consideration, you will get a figure that you will require per annum in the first year of your retirement. Now, this is the figure that you need in the first year of retirement because, why do I say first year of retirement? Because post retirement also there is going to be inflation. So, second year of retirement is going to be a little more than what is going to be required in the first year of retirement. Then you estimate a corpus that you will require, which will fund that particular amount per annum have a figure with you that this is the kind of corpus that you require say probably 1 crore, 2 crores or 3 crores depending on whatever the amount you have estimated. Then you work backwards, you have 25 years from now, how much do you invest at a, in a particular asset class which will generate that kind of returns to give you that corpus at the end of 25 years. So this is the methodology wherein you start putting amounts, you start putting figures to your retirement plan. Firoz, when like Harsh spoke about retirement and how the way of you know allocating your money into different asset classes to help a better retirement. What are these asset classes? What are the main ones? Because there's a lot of confusion and more importantly, how do I allocate my investment money into those asset classes? Yes, the main asset classes uh, which are very unitized and which can be bought in small portions are equity, debt and some amount of precious metal. These are the unitized asset classes, right? There are other more tangible asset classes like real estate and stuff. Uh, there are more, more uh, tangible assets like real estate, but sticking on to these equity, debt and, and precious metal. When, when you have split your money in the starting, when you're starting to invest, when you split your money between these three asset classes and then when your goals come closer, okay, you need to start reducing your exposure to equity. What happens is if you have an exposure, uh, let's assume if your asset allocation is 70% equity and 30% into debt over long periods of time, right? And then your goal is coming closer. You want certainty to your goal being achieved. So as if let's assume you have only two years to your goal uh, uh, time, time wise. So then you start reducing your equity exposure and gradually bring it down to zero when the goal is actually finally arrived. Harsh, let's talk about insurance because that is a very unspoken or or rather everyone talks about that only when February and March comes because I have to save my money. So how important is life insurance and how important is health insurance? Uh, well, the first stage of financial planning is protection. What do we mean by protection? It does not mean that you have wealth which you are going to stash away in a place which is safe in nature, which is a fixed deposit. That's not what we talk about protection. We are talking about an asset which is you. You are an income generating asset for your family. There are dependents on you. 
So, if as much as you do not like the word insurance because you have been pestered to buy it, you need to protect yourself. <coughs> if you look at general insurance, you say you know you insure your car, you insure your factories, okay, motor insurance is compulsory, mandatory, but your factories are not. But you will see invariably all companies will insure the factories because they understand the risk. There is a loss if that some if some damage happens to the factory, right? Because it's a revenue generating asset for the company. So, in that context, you have to buy insurance for yourself. If you have not protected yourself, you have not bought adequate and the correct insurance for yourself, there are dependents who are going to be in terrible financial situations in case something unfortunate happens to yourself. So, yes, insurance is the first step. Look at it positively. How would you look at it positively is the right kind of product that you buy. If you want to adequately cover yourself, the first step is that you buy a term insurance plan. There are options available which you can go and buy online directly, so they are even cheaper. For a, for a 30 year old person, a 1 crore cover can be, uh, can, you know, he can cover himself a 1 crore at an annual premium of 10 to 12,000 rupees. But Harshina, they always talk about, you know, going for a ULIP and about how ULIP should be better. So, is ULIP a better option rather than a term? Well, term insurance <coughs> is going to basically serve the purpose of giving you a life cover. Hmm. ULIPs Pure and insurance. any other form of investment oriented policies are basically from an investment or, uh, perspective. Okay, okay. Because they are much more costly. We spoke about a 1 crore cover being available to a 30 year old at 10 to 12 thousand rupees per annum. Hmm. The same 1 crore cover, if he has to take from an investment oriented policy, he would have to pay at least a 5 to 7 lakhs per annum. Okay. Uh, Firoz, a couple, we spoke to a couple of them earlier and people all asked us about children's plans. So somebody was asking me about what is a children's plan, how should I invest in a children's plan, is it a good call to invest in a children's plan? So your thoughts on that? So, in my opinion, uh, a children's plan uh, is basically trying to play on the emotional factor that it's for your child. Mm -hmm. But that's not the only only uh, only investment which you have as an option. If you want to save for your child, one is that the money you've been investing grows enough so that the objective is met. What happens is when you're saving for your child, you're generally saving for his education or his marriage more, more so mm -hmm. after which he takes care of himself so when it comes to education education is one of the expense which inflates at almost twice the rate of the rest of the uh, expenses so because uh, if seven eight percent is the inflation on more more or less the other commodities but you would see education uh, there's some data which says 21 percent is the inflation over the last 10 years on higher education so you need to be very careful on the amount you collect so it's not about the plan you buy you need to be very careful about deciding what amount you would need Harsh, I want to talk to you now about uh, one asset class which is called equity. Now, equity is supposed to be a little volatile. So, the people always say, why should I invest in equity or for that matter gold or other asset classes when I can park my money safe and sound in a fixed deposit which is in my bank, it's in my control, it's there always. What's your take on that? Well, there are two kinds of risks that, uh, that persist when we invest. The first is volatility, the erosion of capital that we fear and the second is inflation. Well, while in first instance, there is a possibility that your money may not grow or basically reduce in value after a particular period of time, the other is a certainty. Inflation will reduce the value of your money whether you do nothing with it as well. So, while I am saying, uh, uh, you know, equities is an asset class which gives you a, a return which has a potential rather to give you a return which is more than inflation, I hmm. am not saying fair bank fixed deposits can be avoided completely. It is all about asset allocation. Hmm. Now, we spoke about retirement which is 25 years away, which is 30 years away. We have all seen st uh, statistics that equities over a longer period of time give you inflation adjusted positive returns. The idea is if you require something one year down the line and if you are investing to equities, you are in the wrong asset class. If you need something 25 hence years from now and if you are investing into a fixed deposit, you are again in the wrong asset class. The idea is for long term goals which are at least 10 years away, you should park that into equity assets. For anything which is less than uh, 3 years from now, you need to put into debt investments which FD is a part of it. So, make sure you do not park your money with an intention that 100 rupees remains 100 rupees at least in front of your eyes, but the purchasing power has gone down because of inflation, mm -hmm. which is not visible to you. On the other hand, you have an asset which may probably 100 become 80, 80 become 120, it may fluctuate. Mm -hmm. But over a period of time, you will see that the fluctuations reduce and there is almost a certainty <coughs> in the kind of returns that you get post 10 years from now. You're watching NSC Finviz powered by CNBC TV 18. It's time for a very short break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. 
Welcome back. You're watching NSC Finviz powered by CNBC TV 18. Firoz, let's talk about mutual funds. There's a lot of confusion about mutual funds by the way people think it's an asset class. Though actually equity is an asset class and mutual funds is a vehicle to invest in equity. So tell us a little bit about basically what is a mutual fund and also people ask us what is a SIP. So what is a SIP? Okay, great. Yeah, like you rightly mentioned, mutual fund is a vehicle to participate in something and it's not the end itself. For example, if you have a mutual fund which collects money uh, and invests into equities, it's called an equity fund. So it's just a platform to invest, not the end source of investment. So if there is a mutual fund which collects money and invests in debt instruments, what is a debt instrument? Uh, it's one form of one one where one place where you invest and you lend to corporates. It's called debt. When you become partners of corporates, it's called equity. So if there's a mutual fund, it invests in equity, it becomes an equity fund. If it invests in debt, it's called a debt fund, right? So there, these mutual funds are just vehicles to participate in these two asset classes primarily. There's also a third asset classes asset class which mutual funds invest in. Uh, that's some some derivative instruments. So these are the three basic asset classes which a mutual fund can invest in. Okay. Uh, and it could probably there could be some mutual funds invest in all the three or one of these three. Uh, or two of these three. So th on that basis, there are a lot of classifications on mutual funds. Coming to the other, one, other portion of the question, which is an SIP. What is an SIP? SIP is an abbreviation to systematic investment plan. What happens is people, when they are actually earning money, they don't have all the money already earned. They want to invest in small portions on a monthly basis because their incomes are also coming on a monthly basis. So that systematic investment is called a systematic investment plan. Getting into equities, there are some people who might be, who've already been a, a part of the equity market. They've been investing either through mutual funds or directly buying stocks. Now, very often you hear about IPOs and FPOs, which is also, a, you know, people are curious, it's a, it sounds like good, you buy it at a cheaper rate. How good is that? How should one go about uh, when they want to get into IPOs and FPOs? Well, what are IPOs? They're basically initial public offerings. They're companies which are not listed and are coming and offering themselves to be listed. Okay, now there are two ways under which this <coughs> happens. In one context, a company which is issuing fresh shares, which means that the promoter, the existing shareholders are not diluting their stake, but the company is raising fresh capital because it has expansion plans. The other option is wherein there is an offer for sale, wherein an existing shareholder is exiting, he is making an offer to sell those shares and he is going to actually take the money company does not require. So there could be a part of both that there is a promoter also offloading and the company also generating some kind of additional capital. Now there is a myth that if you apply in an IPO, you get at a better price. Well, that's not true. If you are a promoter of a company and you are going to come out with an issue, there are certain criteria you need to be in profits for the next number of years. There is a reasonable size of operations that, you're, that you already have. Do you think you want to come out in the market and give it a cheaper rate to somebody else? So if that is not true, how is IPO cheap? How is getting something in IPO cheap? I am not saying it is even expensive. Don't, don't uh, read between the lines to conclude that it is expensive. It is basically an opportunity to invest into a company which was up till now not listed. That's the only definition that you could possibly take back for with respect to IPOs. Mm. Then your study starts after that, whether the pricing at which it has been offered is good or not good, whether what is the peer standards. If there is a manufacturing company into textiles, you go and you know verify what the textile industry PE has been. If there is a technology company which is coming out, you understand the business and what are the other options available to you. That's with respect to IPO. Uh, FPO is a follow on public offer. A company which is already listed is going to raise money. So obviously it is going to raise it at a price which is lesser than otherwise nobody would apply to it. So just because it is coming out with a price which is lesser than its current market price does not again make it attractive. Whether that valuation by itself is worth it, uh, the worth its while or not is something that you need to get into. You, uh, Firoz, earlier you mentioned on the types of mutual funds, but the mutual funds have a different level of volatility or risk on depending on the kind of mutual fund it is. So just some uh, a little bit, could you shed some light on what is, which kind of mutual fund is more risky and which one is less risky So for the people who have, depending on their risk appetite. Correct. So liquid fund is so diverse that you can have an option for yourself to invest even for a week's time. 
to somewhere where you can invest for almost 10, 15, 20 years. So from a time frame perspective, you have a very large spectrum to choose from, right? The ones, so of course, for a short term, you would not take so much risk. So let me uh, start by telling you the first one, which is a very, very liquid instrument. It's by itself called a liquid fund where you put your money. There are some corporates which put money over weekends as well. So that's, that's the kind of uh, uh, liquidity which is available uh, on, on specific schemes. So liquid funds is one thing, which is a major category which you need to keep in mind. Uh, the next one could be a short term fund. These are debt schemes. Where, where the money is going into bonds and NCDs and other debt instruments. So one is liquid fund, the other is a short term fund. There are other instruments called fixed maturity plans, which are one of the most tax efficient, very low risk uh, instruments called fixed maturity plans. They have a specific period in which they automatically mature. So if I invest today, if it's a fixed maturity plan of one year, automatically after one year, you will get your money back and you will not have to redeem and the return expectation is also more or less known at the beginning of the investment more or less known not second decimal but you would know that you will make eight to nine percent or nine to ten percent and because they are tax efficient you will get as much return as much you would get by in an fd would be almost about 12 13 percent if you take a 12 percent fd if your tax rates are 20 percent you will get how much only 9.6 percent so an fmp is a very tax efficient instrument then moving on to the equity side just focus on two equity categories one is a large cap fund one is a mid cap fund a large cap fund is one which collects money from different individuals creates a pool and invests in only the large stocks of the country Okay, maybe the top 100 or the top 200 companies in the country, M uh, predominantly companies which are worth more than 10, 15,000 crores in market capitalization. So your, your risks on the large cap fund are marginally lower or probably in some cases significantly lower as well to another mutual fund which invests in mid cap companies, which are future large cap companies. You're watching NSC Finwiz powered by CNBC TV 18. It's time for a very short break, but on the other side, the audience puts forth their questions for our experts. Don't go anywhere.